Amen. Well, good morning. Everybody eat too much? I did. But I ran a 5K that morning. It was a dumb, dumb decision, but I did, and I doubly made up for it uh, with Thanksgiving dinner. Um, we're talking about endurance uh, and what we need to have, uh, w- what it takes to have endurance this morning. Um, and I want us to be reminded that in Hebrews, we have a, a bunch of people who are following Christ, but uh, they are being oppressed. And so what is it going to take? What, uh, w- what does God need to do? Because what he's just done, we spent a long time in one chapter, Hebrews 11, and it was all uh, the heroes of our faith. And um, kind of the question now is, so what? Right? So, 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 here, so here are all our heroes. Uh, so what, God? Uh, what are we going to do? H- how do we deal with life? And so let's just go ahead and jump right in. This is Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now just for one second, think, what are, what are they talking about? Since we are surrounded by such great a cloud of witnesses, what, what does that mean? Well, here's what the scriptures say. That when we die, uh, the souls of believers right, go up into heaven and their bodies are still in the grave. But there's a real sense in which we, are, we have these witnesses. And you and I have witnesses such as Moses and Noah and Rahab. And they are all in the stands at Raymond James. And they are watching us play this game. They are watching us run this race. And they're saying, come on, you keep going. I remember when I was there you know, in, in, the, in the Colosseum. I remember when I was fighting those lions, when, when I was you know, trying to stay alive. And, and what sin does, they're saying, is, is it's like running this 5K. Um, I saw two dudes with like 35-pound packs on their back. Who does that, right? I mean, that's just idiocy to me. Uh, why, why would you run with 35-pound weights on you? Um, And that, I mean, I had that. It's just extra weight uh, that's inside my body, not outside. But, and I definitely felt that. And and what what he's saying is, look, is there a a weight pack of sin that entangles you? Is there something that when you get going and you hit mile one, why is your heart rate so high? Why are you having to strain so hard? He says that that's what sin is. It's, it's this um, weight that easily entangles us. It hinders us. Because ultimately, what do we want? We want to run with what? With endurance. And that's my question to you. Do you have endurance? What has it been like for you to run the Christian race? Has it been one of these things where, you know, you make it 400 meters, you make it one lap around the track, and you're like, okay, I'm done for now. And you, and you kind of get off, you kind of step off the team and you sit on the bench. What the world during that time needed, first century Rome, it needed athletes, Christian athletes that would endure. They wouldn't just stop because that's what they were seeing. They were seeing Christians that once push came to shove, once there was some oppression, or they didn't deal with their sin. I mean, you think about the sin of, let's let's just take a vice. Think about the sin of, let's just say, alcoholism. Or, yeah, uh, being a drunk, if you will. How much that sin, which the Bible says it's not a sin to drink, but it's a sin to be drunk. The, The sin of drunkenness, if you don't deal with an addiction like that, and if you don't take that weight off, I mean, over your race, how, how, how um, much uh, distance you do not run because of that weight. Think about the generations, right, that affects. Think about your firstborn daughter or your youngest son who's staring at a father who has this weight, wanting them just to take it off. Dad, will you just stop? 
Well, you just learn self-control, but we don't deal with it. And it entangles, and it, and it, and it hurts us, and we, we don't get nearly as far as we should. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about Moses looking out, down at you. I think about my two grandmothers all the time. These two ladies in my life that just were such sweet, soft voices. I think they're watching me. They are watching me. They're witnessing the way I'm running the race. And man, you know what? They are two of my heroes, but think about all the heroes we, we walk through. The writer of Hebrews is saying, will you think about those? So that you'll get up if, you fell, if you've fallen down, that you'll get up and start running again? You need to use what? We are called to use what we just went through over the past, what, five, six weeks? Let's go to the next slide. Spiritual heroes. They are to be used for motivation. You are to think about these men and women of God, men and women who've gone before you and are now, what, are now just witnesses to you because you are in the arena and God wants to use you. And so, uh, as we think about these types uh, of men and women, spiritual heroes should be used for our motivation. But once you get up, and once you start running, here's what he says to do with your eyes. When you start running the race here, he says, fix your eyes on Jesus. The pioneer and perfecter of faith. In, in a number of other translations, it's, uh, he is the originator. He is the one who birthed faith in you. And perfected, that means completed action. He is the one who carries on. The, he is the one who starts it and completes it. Are you just walking? Or are you barely jogging? And maybe it's now it's time for you to start running. You need to, you need to I mean, I was checking my pace, just trying to make beg God that I at least had a 10 minute mile for this thing and he wants us to run faster than that he wants us to be able to over time have this endurance so that we can sprint and we can run um, so that God will use us so fixing our eyes on Jesus here's what he did the, pi uh, the, the pioneer and perfecter of faith for the joy set before him he what he endured the cross He's scorn, scorning its shame, and it, it, meaning he devalued the shame that he went through. I mean, think about the times in your life that you've been shamed over something. Jesus, who literally died a sex predator's death, if you will. Like the lowest level of person that you can think of right now. That's the type of death Jesus died. He went through that devaluing. He went through that type of public scorn for us and he said you know what no no i am not going to live in that for the joy set before him for him completing right his death descending into the perils of hell and what beating that he sat he sits down at the right hand of the throne of god when you what do you why do you sit down if there's an action that's been completed Here's a priest that's completed the action of sacrifice. It's done. There are no more sacrifices anymore. It's completed action. That's what Jesus did for you and for me. He scorned, he, he scorned its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So when, you're, when you begin to run and you think about those heroes, because you know, that, that can last for a little bit, but what's gonna keep you going is if you stare at Jesus and you realize what he has done for you. When, when you realize what he has gone for, for you. When you see Jesus in other people, people willing to sacrifice. Mary Daniel had been in this uh, nursing facility in Jacksonville for a number of years and every single night her, her husband, who dealt with, uh, who is dealing with a severe case of dementia, went to see him and talked, and he loved it when his wife touched him, held his hand, touched his shoulder. Well, March the 11th, um, through, a very, through different you know, reasons, they had to be separated. 
And for 115 days, Mary Daniel did not get to see her husband. Thinking, what is this? Is he fully gone? Is he even going to remember me? I have to get back to him. And sure enough, 115 days later, she gets a call from the memory care unit saying, you know what? You can't see him uh, because uh, you know, you're not living here. But here's what we do have. We have a part-time dishwasher job. If you take this part-time dishwasher job, you know what you get to do? You get to see your husband. And she said, you better sign me up. I will wash dishes to see my husband. I don't care what I have to go through. That's what Jesus said to you. I don't care what I have to go through. I will go through the cross for you. And when you fix your eyes on the man who originated and perfected your faith, I believe we're changed. I believe that we can go through all kinds of um, obstacles. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners. Consider he was laughed at. Considered the, the uh, shards of glass in the whip that, was, uh, that whipped his back and pulled the skin off his back. Consider that, please. Think about that who endured such opposition from sinners so that when you get tired and you say, I don't want to do it anymore. I am tired. I, I just, you know what being a Christian is doing? It's lumping me in. And I don't want to even want to say I love Jesus because you know what I look like? I look like this. And you know what it's doing to my work? And you know, when I, when I go to high school, you know what it's doing to my friendships? When I say that Jesus is my king? When I say he is the one that I fix my eyes on, you know what that does to me socially? Do you, you not understand that? Do you not understand the personal freedom that I feel like I lack because I am fixing on him? And he says, consider what he went through for you. So, right, then you feel that cramp coming up. When you feel like, oh man, I just want to walk. No, don't, don't walk. You keep jogging. You keep moving at a good pace. Because Jesus, at any moment, as, as the you know, creator of the world, as the, the sustainer of the world, could have looked at you and said, you know what, you're not worth it. Really? I'm going to go through all of this for you? Out. He could have done that to each and every one of us in this room. And he said, no. You are worth it. You are worth the run. You are worth what? You are worth the pain. In fact, the writer of Hebrews says, do you know how, how much I want you to fight? He says this, for some of you in your struggle against sin that's holding you back, you haven't even, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your own blood yet. That's how I know that you aren't even, your heart rate isn't even really that high. So what? You, you didn't get a raise. So what? Um, you know, you lost a few friends. So what? You, 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 you know, you gave away this money here or there. You haven't even shed blood yet. That's how I know, right? And when you think about, I think uh, in, in, these, in this age, there was the ancient Greek had this competition in the Olympics called the pentathlon, right? And the pentathlon was the first, it was a 200 meter sprint and then you had a long jump and then you had a uh, discus throw and then you had a javelin but I think what he's talking about here is the last is the last uh, competition and that was wrestling and you're allowed to wear these leather gloves right but these leather gloves lots of times bloodied um, you know the, the opponent or you were bloodied by your opponent and what he's saying is look yeah if you're going to run you're going to get bloodied if you're going to be in this fight, are you willing to shed blood? And if you haven't done that, if you haven't, what, been persecuted, no, then you aren't running as fast as you can. You aren't giving as much effort. This isn't to shame or to say that you have to uh, run like this to be saved. This is saying, do you know what you've been given in your salvation? Do you know how, how fast you can run if you give it all to the Lord? You know, your, all our houses could be burned down. Every one of our cars could be taken um, after service, right? 
We could lose all kinds of loved ones, and we can what? We could still sing the song that Job sang, right? Naked I come, naked I go, blessed be the name of the Lord. Now that's a sermon. That life is a sermon. He is saying to you and to me, that's the type of freedom you have. If, what? If you give it all to me, if you stare at the spiritual heroes, that will get you up off the couch, that will get you up from, you know, get you from walking maybe to running, and then you just stare at Jesus, and you study Jesus, and you read his parables, and you read his miracles, and you read his sermons, and you think, that's the dude that saved the world that I'm supposed to be like. Let me check my life. Let me take inventory. How's my family? How am I leading my family? How am I serving my family? How's my marriage? How are my friendships? How's my own private life? Who am I when no one is looking? What, what are the things that I do? And when I walk out my door and I look to my right and I look to my left and I see my neighbors, do I even care? <laughs> does, does my heart do anything? Except for, I hope they're not going to critique my Christmas lights, right? <laughs> or lack thereof. When, if you want to run, the writer of Hebrews saying that Jesus, what? Jesus has to be the what? Jesus has to be the destination. Because then you will get up, and you will not walk, and you, and you will begin to run in ways that you never thought for lengths of time, you never thought imaginable. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than you could even ask or imagine. Please, West Town, get up, right? Get up, as Mickey said to Rocky. Because Mickey loves you. That's what he said to Rocky. Get up. Verse 5, remember there's a process here. And have you completely forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. This is straight Proverbs 3, but it's also got a a, a reference to Revelation. And there were letters that angels, uh, messages that angels sent to these seven churches. One of the churches was the church of Laodicea. And this church was neither hot nor cold. It was described as lukewarm. And I sometimes get nervous that, hey, well, West Town isn't cold, right? But are we hot? Because what the angel of the Lord message came from the Lord to Laodicea was, I, when you are lukewarm, it makes me want to vomit, the Lord says. You are neither hot nor cold, You need to what? You need a good rebuke. And I think some of us, we don't have, we are so, our culture has said, we are so sensitive, we are so entitled, we feel so privileged about anything when a rebuke comes your way. Or if I think one of my kids needs a hard word, I need to come down hard. What culture, whoa, 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 no, you can't come down at all. You cannot rebuke or discipline? Are you kidding me? That leads to abuse, of course, we know. We know the terrible, terrible extremes of what? Uh, Abusive fathers and mothers. That's not what this this is talking about. This is about a father who loves, what? Who loves his son. A mother who loves her daughter and sees her walking down the wrong path and she needs to rebuke her. He needs to rebuke his son. That is gold. Think how many times someone came into your life, if you're older, or maybe you're a father right now, or you've been fathered well, and you thought, oh my goodness. I remember a few talks that a number of different types of fathers that God gave me had, my own being one of them. Frank, Frankie, you can't go this way. You can't. I'm seeing the type of character. I'm getting nervous, right? I'm getting nervous. Frankie, that life that you want to live at Florida State, that frat life that you could easily dive into and just dive into that world, I I don't think you should go there. That is not what you need, pal, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. If he didn't love you, he wouldn't say anything to you. 
right? I mean, whatever. I don't want drama, right? I'm done with it. No, God says, I want to make you right. Think, if you've ever seen the movie Gladiator, the very beginning of that movie, Russell Crowe is kind of anointed the next emperor or the next leader of Rome. And Marcus Aurelius has this very evil, deceiving son, Commodus, who was played by Joaquin Phoenix. He was, he was unbelievable. And there's this, there's this powerful scene where Marcus Aurelius brings his son in and says, son, you are not going to be the next leader of Rome. And Commodus says, dad, what, what have I done? I've got these traits and all of a sudden, Marcus Aurelius starts crying, and he drops to his knees, and he holds his, his son's hand. He says, your faults as a son are my failures as a father. I didn't rebuke you. I didn't discipline you, and you are out of control, pal, and I should have done that. I, as your father, who should have loved you better. And so... How do we think about this? Because we have a heavenly father and many of us right now are doing this in verse seven. We're experiencing hardship in ways, right? We're experiencing tension in ways. You know, thinking something as, something um, like a, a mask, right? Wearing a mask could be as volatile as it is right now. It could be as like game changing as it is. It feels so, like what is happening? But, this virus, the tension, the racial tensions, the political upheaval, endure hardship as what? As discipline. We are to view this as discipline. God is training you as his kids. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone goes through discipline, then you are not legitimate. And that's what Marcus Aurelius said to Commodus. I have blown it. You are not legit. Russell Crowe is, and he is not my son. Someone rebuked and disciplined him. That's why he is a true man, but I have not done that to you. Then you are not legitimate, and you are not true sons and daughters at all. And some of us want to get saved, and we want to get on the lifeboat, but you don't want to get rebuked. You don't want someone to say, hey, you know what? You talk too much. You gossip a ton, right? You have a bad marriage and no one wants to tell you that but God is telling you you are not a good son you are a father and you're exasperating your kids you're a son or a daughter and you're not obeying your parents no one wants to do that because we are in this non we're in this world where we can't say hard but truthful loving things and the writer of Hebrews is we have to develop this type of skin and as you look around, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, do we have that? Do you have that? Could you hear someone say, you've never really picked up a Bible. You have been insecure about the Bible and your lack of knowledge, but you've never picked one up and read it and studied it. Why is that if it's the word of God? You don't spend time praying. You get frustrated with not hearing God, but you don't spend any time praying. That's what a loving father says to his son. That's what a loving mom says to a daughter. Every child at some point in their upbringing needs options removed. In other words, that's the biblical de definition of, of, of discipline. You remove options, right? When a kid gets in trouble and are disciplined, you remove, they're on restriction, man. You do not have freedom. You know what? As spiritual kids, there are times when we need to be disciplined. And we need to go through the five, right? The five purposes that we're all called to. We are called to be discipled. We're called to worship. We're called to share and evangelize. We're called to what? Serve one another and we're called to have good fellowship. The five purposes of the church. And you can just use those as a template if you will. How am I doing spiritually? Am I, am I being discipled? Am I growing internally? Am I sharing my faith, the outward push of the gospel? Am I looking up and singing to him passionately? Am I serving in some capacity my brother or sister in Christ? Am I what? Am I uh, fellowshipping with them? Well, we, we do all those things. 
And, and some of us need to have other worldly options that aren't necessarily bad or sinful removed so that the main things can be the main things. And then when those, when those get locked in, then, yeah, okay, then we bring in these secondary things. Moreover, we've had, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? How do you react to these verses? If, if you're an adult man or woman, and it says, God chastens, God disciplines those that he loves. And we're all called to be disciplined. We're all called to be chastened. That doesn't mean that we're not saved. It just means it's time to go from being a three-year-old toddler Christian to being a right, you know, prepubescent Christian. And then if you're there, then it's time to, to, to really move into a young single, right? A, or a young you know, teen or older teen type of... And for some of you that have been there for a while, it's time for you to become a full-fledged adult, mature Christian. And you know what that means? You've got to start discipling other people. You, you have to be the Paul, and you need to go find a Timothy. You need a Timothy to disciple. And if you're a Timothy, maybe you need to look for a Paul to disciple you if you've never been. But he says, it's time. It's not the time to walk. It's not the time to take a break and you know, get your breath. We all have had that. What he needs, what the writer of Hebrews, what the church needed, was enduring, disciplined Christians. Verse 3, or verse 10. They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But, speaking of our parents, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. I mean, what if, what if as a church we did not in any way take action when people have sinned in, in major ways? What if we didn't do that? If we just said, ah, no, your life is your life and we don't have any... No, the Bible says that we are called to have spiritual oversight in the church. Now, churches have, I believe, have over extended their arm, but there are many churches that will never ever get in your chili at all. And, and there's no discipline that can happen, spiritually. They can't. And that's part of the church's responsibility is to do that. Is to say, okay, you know what? We need to make sure that we, you know, that, that our people, the people that we're that are calling themselves West Town, West Town Presbyterian Church members, the core of our church, are they living this out? And if they're not, then, in a good way, well, what do we need to work on? In which way should you be disciplined? In which way do I, as a pastor, need to be disciplined? Or some of the elders? What, are we always looking for ways to grow, to discipline our areas of weakness? So two, two and a half years ago, um, uh, my, my uh, in-laws, Lou's sister, uh, came into town with their, their three kids. And the middle daughter... Her name's Julia. She, she uh, asked if we could contact Tampa Prep. She lives in Knoxville. Uh, so that uh, on two mornings of their three-day stage uh, stay, that she could drive down to the University of Tampa and swim with University of Tampa or whatever, uh, 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 yeah, Tampa Prep or University of Tampa Swim Club. I said, what? You're on vacation. What are you doing? She goes, no, this is, you know, I, I, I mean, she said, no, I want to do this. So at five in the morning, on vacation, Julia and Amy get up. They drive down to University of Tampa, wherever the pool was down there, for two hours, right? For two hours. So we go up to Nashville this weekend, or this week for Thanksgiving. And there's Julia. And she drives 35 minutes at 4.45 in the morning to the UT's campus, Right? And, and then she comes back, and she's, she's just a pleasure. I mean, what a, what, a, what a great girl. And then, you know, uh, the next morning, she does the very same thing. And, you know, you see her, and she's like, yeah, I, I was in the pool for two and a half hours, and we're, like, waking up, you know. What? This is, I am a lazy man, and I don't do anything. Um, but she, 
was amazing. And, and then she said, you know, th- the big news was two weeks ago she signed, right? She got the full, full scholarship, D1 scholarship, University of Tennessee, top 10 swimming school in the nation. And then I started asking her, I said, um, so what are your times? And she goes, well, my time is a 2.03, two minutes and three seconds in uh, the 200 meter freestyle. I said, okay, that seems like that's a good time. She goes, well, I'm two seconds from the Olympic trials. Two seconds. She thinks she can make the Olympic trials in, uh, coming up in June. But what did she do? She removed options. And she goes, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to discipline my life. Because you know what? I think it's going to reap a reward. What's the last verse? No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. You know, pain is the cost. Pain is the cost of righteousness. Are you willing to go through the pain? And that means, yeah, Am I willing to devote myself to this book, this ancient book, to praying to an invisible God, to leading and being with my family and having spiritual conversations, like real conversations that most families don't have, right? Let's just go binge watch a Netflix or let's, let's play, you know, I mean, it's good to play games and all that stuff, but I mean, you know, when you really need to address a family issue because something is wrong and, and God is not here, no, we are not gonna do this. I'm not gonna let this destroy my marriage. I'm not gonna, you, you, you fill in the blank. Because when you go through that type of pain, you say, you know what? I have to go through this. There's this flaw in my character I have to deal with. And it's going to take some time. You know what? Maybe I need 28 days to go to rehab. And maybe I need to leave my job. Or maybe I need to move my family from this part of town because of friendships that I watch my kids get into. I've seen parents do that. And they, they do the painful thing, right? Uprooting and t- just so that they feel like they can save their son or their daughter because they're going down the wrong path. The pain of that. You, 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 the pain of getting up early and saying, I'm going to spend time with God. Or I'm going to cut out my lunch time, and I'm not going to lunch. I'm going to spend time with God. Because I don't even think I know what it's like to really be in a relationship with God. I said a sinner's prayer once at a crusade, maybe. And I think I'm saved, but I don't know God. And I'm going to devote myself to this relationship. What is it that you need to endure? What discipline do you need to go through? It's not going to be pleasant. It's going to be painful. Your friends and family may laugh at you, but, and this is where, do you come to this word by faith or are you a pragmatist? If it gives me the results I want, then I'll do it. It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who, who have been trained by it. It's like, the, I forget his name, but the Sunday school teacher who was there for 30 years who said, you know what, I, I believe God's gonna use us, God's gonna use us, God's gonna use us. And next thing you know, I think it was in the early 1900s, a kid by the name of Billy Sunday comes and this Sunday school teacher, God uses to save him. Little did, and this guy died off, but little did he know that Billy Sunday and his revivals would, would what? Would be the, the, the big moment for a guy by the name of Billy Graham to be saved. And then next thing you know, you know, the amount that God does through our discipline, we may never see, but we trust that there will be a harvest of righteousness. So let me just ask you, where are you? We have to live in hope. We have to live like the prophets lived. We live in hope. And you know what? Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel, they had to endure a lot. But it was their examples, God in them, that kept that one core remnant. A lot of Israel fell away, but that core remnant would stare at those prophets and say, okay, I'm looking at Jeremiah. I'm looking at Ezekiel who's lying on his side for 180 days. Weird guy. But I know he loves the Lord. Right? Where are you? The whole hall of faith was to push us into, into, into Hebrews 12, to say, let's endure discipline. Let's endure this pandemic well. And let's focus 
and always make the main thing the main thing, and that's fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let me pray and ask God to be with us.